Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody today to the fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series. I'm Dory Mincer, owner of Revolutionize Retirement and your host for today. I am totally delighted that today our guest is Elizabeth Eisel. I have been following Elizabeth over the years. As you will see, such an incredibly impressive woman, and I'm just so delighted, Elizabeth, to have you with us today. I want to just tell you a little about Elizabeth. She's recognized globally as a pioneer, senior, and intergenerational entrepreneurship expert, and she's leading a movement to transform the culture of aging and retirement. Her passion to ignite a silver economy by unleashing the experience and the potential of 50-plus-year-olds to drive an economic markets and generate social and environmental impact is grounded in data and metrics. She embodies the silver economy. As a septuagenarian, after a really distinguished career as an award-winning editor and author, she founded the Global Institute for Experienced Entrepreneurs, or GIE, a comprehensive cross-sector which includes business, government, education, and research ecosystem to catalyze and support intergenerational experience in the future of work, entrepreneurship, and artificial intelligence. She's also a senior fellow in social innovation and entrepreneur in residence at Babson College in Wellesley, Mass., and she's an associate fellow in finance and global economics, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, London, in the UK. In the fall of 2021, she was interviewed by Globant to, for their Be One of a Kind series to share the one of a kind value of workers age 50 plus. She's also published numerous reports, articles, and opt-ed pieces on 50-plus entrepreneurship and is continually quoted and profiled in the media and publications such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Bloomberg, etc. She was named a Journalism and Aging Fellow by the MetLife Foundation and the Gerontological Society of America. She's a Tribeca Disruptor Disruptive Innovation Fellow, Foundation Fellow, and an Influencer in Aging by PBSNextAvenue.org. There was another, I just wanted to read this little first paragraph, or because I just found another little introduction of her that I just love the flow of it. I wanted to read the more explicit ones, but this one is, recognized globally from the hallowed halls of Congress, the domes of Istanbul, the golden spires of Oxford University, and the cockpit of a vintage biplane, Elizabeth is a pioneering senior entrepreneurship expert, and she's leading the transformation of the culture of aging and retirement. Her passion is to ignite an experienced economy by unleashing the potential of cross-generational experience to drive social and economic impact. And as I said before, it's grounded in data and metrics. She has successfully been bustling the prevailing gloom and doom myths that this huge demographic wave is a silver tsunami silver tsunami, by demonstrating how the experienced economy is a silver lining yielding golden locally and globally. I just love that start, so I just wanted to add that, Elizabeth. So I am so delighted to have you here and to be my guest. And it's taken a while, and I've been wanting you to be part of this for a while, and here you are. So welcome. Thank you, Dory. It's a pleasure to be here, and I welcome all the people who are listening to this. As you, I love nothing better than talking about this passionate belief I have that the over 50 population is the world's largest untapped resource. And I feel especially privileged to be part of your 10th anniversary, Joy. That's an accomplishing <laughs> in and of itself. And, and to bring these resources to the world is extremely important. And you do it with such grace and insight. 
that, as I say, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Oh, thank you. I'm, as I said, I'm delighted that you're here today. So why don't you tell all of us about what got you interested in workers over 50? I know that you're a great storyteller, and maybe you can just help us know what got you to where you are today. What got me to where I am today is that when I was in my 60s, the, I was working for a foundation at that time, which was closing. And ironically, it was a wonderful foundation for funding social enterprise. And But the founder became ill and the foundation closed. And I found myself trying to determine what else I would like to do, what kind of work I would like to do, because I wanted to continue my interest in social enterprise, and I found myself being completely ignored when I spoke with people about wanting to help them, wanting to work with them, wanting to find a job in essence. And I realized that this age barrier was enormous, and I was looking at people like myself out there who wanted to continue contributing, who wanted to share their experience and expertise with different corporations or governments or universities around the world. And I thought, I really want to find out just how pervasive this is and if this is something that the individuals themselves wanted to continue working and contributing, that this wasn't just some figment of my imagination that I, Elizabeth, wanted to continue doing this. I started a blog and I Put the, I had never started a blog before, and it was called SavvySeniorsWork.com, and I found a webmaster who helped me set it up because at that point I did not know a lot about the technology and asked her what I should do, what I should say, and she was brutally honest and said, it really doesn't matter because people aren't going to listen anyway. So those of you who know me know that is the ultimate challenge, and I think, how can I get people to listen? And I, what I really, what drives me in terms of engagement for people is that long ago I understood that people will not listen unless they know that you care. And if they know that you care, they will listen. And so I started this blog, and of course, with the webmaster saying nobody would listen or read it, I thought that gives me all kinds of latitude to say whatever I wanted to say in a very realistic way to this audience that I hoped might be out there. So I started the blog, and within six weeks, I had responses from every continent in the world except for Antarctica. And it was like, it still gives me goosebumps, because I knew at that point I had touched upon a topic that people over 50 wanted to remain relevant, wanted to remain contributing to society. And I think what we have really done in society today with all the negative aspects of aging, we really overshadow the assets of aging. And I think furthermore, what we have done is while there is a lot of work on aging per se for individuals, there has been literally nothing or very little about how society ages. And we need to take it to the broader concept that how individuals age directly impacts how society ages. It has an economic impact. It has a social impact. It has all manner of impact in terms of society continuing to be a thriving effort and thriving economically and thriving socially and thriving health-wise. And I just realized the opportunity was enormous and that this was a topic. And in a true entrepreneurial sense, I had hit a topic that was a huge need. And then my challenge was, how do I fulfill that need? So how did you create this organization? Maybe tell us about the organization, what it does, because part of I've been reading a lot of what you've been writing and a lot about you, and I know from my own readings that you deal with both the individual and globally. I help the listeners just know about your organization and what you've been doing over these years, because you started, what, in 2015 or what year? 2015. 
2012, actually. 2012, and, I'm sorry. Uh, cause it, yep. As Senior Entrepreneurship Works was the beginning of the Global right. Institute yep. because Senior Entrepreneurship Works was, again, started. we started, as I did with a blog, focusing on the individual and how to help that individual understand that they've really been entrepreneuring their entire lives. So stop thinking about entrepreneurship as somebody working from their garage to launch a phenomenal tech program, but to think about entrepreneurship as a mindset and how you've been living and how you've been acting and how to translate all that entrepreneurial experience that you have had in your 50 years of life and work, how to translate it into the next iteration of what you want to be and what you want to contribute. And to that point, we started the Experience Incubator, which is literally a workshop that we host for people, individuals again, in terms of helping them translate their life work experience into what they're going to do next. And it's an incredibly comprehensive program where we take people back through their lives so they can begin to see the ways in which they started to think entrepreneurially. And we go back to the very first decade of people's lives. And so in this one exercise, which is the most popular, and we call it decoding your entrepreneurial history, is where decade by decade, people in the workshop identify one accomplishment per decade of which they were most proud. And then they have to say, how did they achieve that accomplishment? Who helped them along the way? And what was the overall impact of that accomplishment? And so decade by decade, they identify things and they see the relative aspect of each of those accomplishments and what they knew in terms of the resources they had at hand and the resources that they had to get from the outside to make it happen. But one of the most interesting aspects of that is still, to this day, I would say over 90% at least of the participants, the most entrepreneurial effort they were most proud of and they felt was made the most significant contribution to their entire lives happened in their first decade. And so we go back and we look at the facts about what contributes to entrepreneurial mindsets. And it's all about creativity and curiosity and willing to take a risk. And as a child, you're much more willing to do that. And unfortunately, as we grow older and we get into schools, the public school system, at least in the United States, does a superb mm-hmm. job of squashing any kind of creativity and risk-taking in the mindset. And it just gets worse as you get older because it's such we're, and this is globally, too. We're such a competitive society and that if you're in a school, you work as hard as you can because you want to get into the best school, you want to get into the best college, you want to get into the best job, you want the best chance of a promotion. So you are not going to take any risks that will handicap your achieving any one of those things. And so we literally squash creativity because people are afraid to take the risk because they'll lose the opportunity. So that's a very long way of just saying how we work with individuals, but once we started working with individuals, I very quickly realized that it's absolutely no good for an individual to understand how to be an entrepreneur in starting a business or starting or an entrepreneur at their work unless society was going to support this demographic initiative. So then I started reaching out to governments. That's when we had the first U.S. Senate hearing on senior entrepreneurship because I wanted the government to see how impactful this was. This was not just supporting a few seniors. This was not doing something nice for the senior population in the United States. This was really, you are really creating economic engines by supporting these people over 50, and they are going to change the economy. And as I said at that hearing, I said, you waste millions of dollars paying unemployment insurance to people over 50 and over 60 who are never going to get a job again. But you insist 
on their looking for a job or they won't receive those insurance benefits. And I said, if only you turned that money around and made it an investment in senior entrepreneurship and helped seniors get the training they needed or help them get the funds they needed to start a business, the economic return on that investment is going to be enormous because these people starting businesses, no matter how small, are job creators. And it was so, and it was the first Senate hearing on this topic, and it was, they were just going to videotape it through their normal congressional video channel so they could record it. But the room was filled to capacity, and all of a sudden someone said, I think CNN should record it. So CNN came in, recorded that hearing, and that year and for several years afterwards, it was the most watched hearing from the U.S. Senate. And again, it just reinforced that we had hit a need and we just had to do whatever we could to advance this. It, it's not been easy and it's certainly not been quick, but we've made steps along the way and it's very encouraging. But it's, as anything, you have to be diligent and you have to be passionate and you cannot take anything personally in terms of people. When I first went out, people would look at me like I was a lunatic fringe. And I thought, it doesn't matter what they think of me. What matters is what can I do so that they better understand the value of this demographic? I can feel that incredible excitement and passion in you. And I must say, it gives me the chills to just picture you in front of the Senate and the CNN, the recording of it. Is that available so that people can watch it still? Yes. If you go to the U.S., go to, I forget, I think it's Senate.gov. And if you go to Senate.gov and then check the hearing, you will see that. And it was interesting because it almost didn't happen. It was Senator Mary Landrieu was then chairman of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee, and she was, I had been in and about Washington talking about this, and she invited some people to come to, she wanted to solicit insight on what focus she should have in the next upcoming Congress. And I didn't know much about politics, and I thought clearly this was going to be a cast of 100 people coming to say what they thought her priorities should be. But I got to her office, and first I thought I was in the wrong room, because there were only 10 of us in the room. And she really, she was remarkable, because she went around to each and every one of us and asked what their priorities would be. And this was for different, all different cross-sectors of the population. And so everybody said what they wanted and what their needs were. And then she came to me and I said, I really, I don't have a need that I need from you. I said, I have an opportunity for you to change the economy by supporting senior entrepreneurship in the United States. And she looked at me for a second taken back because everybody else had a need and I was saying, I don't have a need. I said, I have an opportunity. And so we were talking about it further. She said, tell me more. And I told her more. I told her some of the, again, the data points, because you'll get nowhere if you just think this is something nice to do for seniors to keep them happy and engaged. You have to be able to demonstrate the businesses that they're creating and how successful they are, data point by data point. And she turned to her chief of staff, and she said, we have to have a Senate hearing on this. So that's how that all came about. And she was just remarkable in bringing all the senators, often at those hearings, everybody doesn't attend, but they were all there. The room was packed, and it was just phenomenal. And that was really one of the first governmental forums in which we knew we could advance this. That's, what year or, did this happen? This was 2014. 2014. Wow. Very impressive. And it ties in, well, a couple, a number of things come to mind, but it's really, you're confronting the interface, it seems to me, of both societal ageism as well as the internalized ageism and how people can just be held hostage to their own inner negative mindset and beliefs in a society that isn't valuing older people. And it's just exciting to hear this. And it, so it does lead me to reading that quote before about that it's not a tsunami, it's the silver lining. Can you talk more about that? Because I, 
I agree. And what are some of the the data points that you have that can help everybody on this call really recognize the silver lining and the opportunities of being older, of being an older person who's curious and creative and willing to take risks. What is that silver lining? The silver lining is when you begin to think of society at large and you think that the research is demonstrating some of the data points, of course, I think that you mentioned or were in what you sent out about the invitation for this session is that the data points prove that, and these come from all over the world. This is not U.S. data specific, but there was a study in England that demonstrated that five years after a startup, 70% of ventures established by older entrepreneurs are still in operation compared to just 28% of enterprises launched by younger entrepreneurs. And this is the fact that more businesses, and this has increased actually during the pandemic, but there are more business startups happening worldwide amongst the 50 to 64-year-old age group than any other demographic. And those are the kind of statistics that people will listen to when we were, I've also done some work with the the EU. And in 2016, they created a phenomenal program. And I have to say that Europe and Australia have really been quite a bit ahead of the United States in picking up on this, regardless of the Senate hearing. Europe and Australia are are really leading this initiative in many ways. Because way back in 2016, the EU created an incredible program called the 50 Plus Entrepreneurship Platform. And they specifically established this platform to boost Europe's economic growth. And which they, the platform, in addition to generating practical education, financing, policy support for these entrepreneurs, which is all that we do at the Institute as well, to get that kind of ecosystem of support. The brilliance of the European program is that it's connecting older entrepreneurs with unemployed youth so that they are blending the elder's life and work experience with millennial technology expertise in order to launch more successful startups and simultaneously combat. The program, it was designed to set up this intergenerational entrepreneurship as well as simultaneously combat youth unemployment in Europe, which at that point was 20.9%. And it's even higher now with youth unemployment. Mm. Some countries, it's actually youth unemployment is over 50%. So they saw the viability of supporting the senior business entrepreneur startup with younger people and their technology skills. So you have this cross categorization of experience and the impact of it in terms of creating jobs and eliminating the huge unemployment statistics in Europe was just another way of and another data point to show the rest of the world how this impacts the economy of your society as a whole. And here in the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, That's a program which I'd say is the least. They need to talk about this program more because it's called Growing Grassroots Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. In this program at the Federal Reserve Bank, which I had presented this idea to them at a conference, and they picked up on it immediately. This wonderful person out in Omaha saw the value of it, especially in rural economic development. So they now have a whole different program for supporting senior entrepreneurs because they understand that this is going to boost rural economic development. And one of the biggest problems in the United States is that young people are all leaving rural areas to go where the business opportunity exists. And so the rural economic development has just plummeted. So in order to shore that up, the Federal Reserve has created this program. And interestingly enough, very similar program happened in Japan, and they understood that in Japan, the young people were leaving just as in the United States and going to the cities for jobs, and the rural areas were being economically devastated. And so they created programs and intergenerational incubators to in rural communities to start businesses with the 50-plus. And, of course, Japan has the largest number of the oldest demographic in the world. So, in fact, Prime Minister Abe created a program 
called Agenomics, which is all about supporting the older entrepreneurs. It's just, it's phenomenal. The rip, positive ripple effect of this is really extraordinary because you look at also people always say silver tsunami that this huge demographic is going to deplete entitlement programs. But the thing is they're not depleting entitlement programs because when the senior entrepreneurs continue contributing, they stay healthy longer and they are contributing economically. So they are really eschewing a dependency role and they're adopting an economically productive role. So that we can demonstrate here in the U.S. they contribute billions of dollars in state and local taxes to support right. such programs as federal security. So, again, it's just such an untapped asset. It's just, it's mind-boggling. I keep thinking that I'm, at one point I'm going to refuse to be surprised that people don't understand that. But I haven't reached that point yet. I still will be in front of an audience of really intelligent, bright, insightful individuals. And they, 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 I was at a session with global leaders in Iceland two years ago. Incredible women leaders from around the world. And I tried out the program, the session that I was doing, think aging is a problem, think again. And people came to that workshop and they were just blown away by the data and the statistics the, and the impact that I presented. But what was so startling to me and so depressing, but as I say, I can't take it personally, I can't be depressed, is so many of them looked at me and said, I really never even thought of that. And I, you just want to bang your head against the <laughs> podium and say, how could you not have thought? You just have to step back and say, thank heavens they are now thinking about it. I guess that's a step in the right direction, but I do hear, I mean, it is extraordinary that people are not really paying as much attention as needs to be paid to the importance of this. And the fact that you're really seeing the total benefit of the inter- intergenerational program, and there's so much emphasis now on that. So how do we get, people listening to this are from all over the globe, so I'm glad you're mentioning other countries, but the predominance of people are in this country, and it does sound like we are we are so lagging behind in the United States. How do people, I mean, I think your experience, the incubator, the experience incubator is one way, but how do people develop this mindset, I guess? How does one become an entrepreneur? And what are ways, what are services or ways or resources that people can be helped with it in addition, and maybe it's through your program, but there may be others, and how to fund something like this? Because I know a lot of times people say, I'm interested in that, I I don't have money, or how do I go about doing it? Can you speak to that at all? People say that all the time. They say the, the biggest hurdle to starting a business is lack of capital to do that. And that's absolutely untrue. The biggest hurdle to starting a business after 50 or even adopting the entrepreneurial mindset is confidence. They absolutely do not have the confidence that they can do it. And so people need to understand how, again, how they've been entrepreneuring all their lives. And we talk about particularly mothers. And you think about how entrepreneurial mothers are. And in terms of caring for the children, getting the children ready for school, taking care of a household, managing household finances, all the different roles that they have as a mother. You have to think entrepreneurially. You have to think rapidly and be able to pivot on your feet because if something goes wrong, you can't just stand there thinking, let's see, how can I get so on? You have to be able to think on your feet. And people don't realize that they have been thinking on their feet for all of their lives. And it's something when people say that lack of capital, and that's absolutely not true because it's at no time in the history of business and creation in the world has it been easier to launch a business. And I say that because with the crowdfunding opportunities we have, and as part of our workshop too, we talk about capitalizing a business and for Pete's sake, don't use your credit cards. Do not, under any circumstances, draw down from your retirement fund. Not when you have something like crowdfunding, where mm-hmm. if you have an idea 
and you want to test that idea. You think about a business and that they have a new idea or a new program that they want to test. They pay thousands of dollars to focus groups to test this idea. And I said, how funny people realize it's an opportunity to raise money to start the business. But even before that, I said, if you have an idea, take it to a crowdfunding platform. And if you put your idea on that platform and ask people to contribute, if they'd be willing to contribute a dollar to help get that business off the ground, and they don't, you have an instant focus group where you suddenly realize you've got to jettison that idea and move on to the next one because, and it's free. It's just people, that's the whole, people don't understand the market opportunity of crowdfunding in terms of focus testing your idea. And some of the people, and just to, to go back to what you said about how do you encourage people to do this or that they can do this, one of the most impressive entrepreneurs that I met and have interviewed over the years is Arlene Blum in California, and she's a 75-year-old biochemist. But before she was a 75-year-old biochemist, she also was a world-class mountaineer. And she really, she was the first woman's team of any part of the world to climb Annapurna, and she just has a brilliant career in terms of mountains that she has climbed. So what's really extraordinary is the mountains she has physically climbed, she has direct parallels in terms of how to set up this business because she set up a business where it's the Green Institute for she's dealing with helping people around the world deal with toxic chemicals such as PFAS, which everybody is talking about nowadays, but it's in all kinds of consumer and other commercial products. And it's one of these polyfluorid combinations I can't even describe. That it's a forever chemical because it's, you cannot get it out. So it's how what your business does is determine alternatives for people to use instead of this PFAS, which is persuasive, pervasive. But I asked her, I said, what would you recommend to people who want to start a business? And this is where her analogy to her mountain climbing skills comes in. And she said, I always recommend the same advice I use for climbing a mountain. And her tips are, number one, define your goals. Determine what you want to do and visualize the summit. Number two, prepare for the expedition. Before launching your enterprise, get your finances in order. Get your every all the resources that you need for this expedition in order before you set out on the expedition. The third point is select a winning team. And she said, choose people you trust with your life. And again, this is the same she uses for any kind of mountain climbing expedition. And the fourth is be passionate. She said, make certain that you have the enthusiasm, the persistence, and the physical, mental, and emotional fitness required for the long climb. And I just love that because it is. It's her, what she did for mountain climbing is so directly applicable to what she needed to start and launch her business, which is now incredibly successful. Oh, what a wonderful example. What are other, I think it may, probably is helpful to hear both those examples, but also what are the other obstacles that people need to confront? You've mentioned the confidence and you've mentioned don't say there's not money because there's this whole crowdfunding kind of thing. Are there other internal obstacles that you've discovered that can paralyze people? Yeah, absolutely. It's there. Unfortunately, there are so many things that can yeah, sure. that they stop before right. they even start. And when you look at all the biases that exist in the world today, be they cultural biases, be they gender biases, any kind of bias you can imagine is going to be a huge obstacle for people to overcome, but they have to overcome it and they have overcome it in different ways in their entire lives. And as I talked with people too and you think about immigrants and I said immigrants come to this country 
And people think, ironically, immigrants start more businesses than a number of other demographics in this country and successful businesses. And you wonder why. And I remember asking a very successful immigrant once why. And she said, to begin with, similar to Arlene's preparation for the expedition, she said, we didn't necessarily have the time to prepare, but many of us were just thrust into this country. And we suddenly, we had to learn the language. We had to learn all the cultural standards. We had to learn what's the proper kind of behavior. We had to learn where to buy our food. We had to learn where to get a job, to get the money to buy the food. And these, this is the entrepreneurial mindset. They land in this country with nothing. And so they have to think about what do I need? And how can I get it? And how can I sustain a life for me and my family? And that's such a big part of it. Another big part is people think that if they just have a small business, it's nothing important. It's not going to make that big an impact. And one of my favorite people, too, it was a woman in Wisconsin that I interviewed who started a small business again. She had been laid off from a technology company, and she thought, what do I want to do next? And she had always loved fabric arts. And she said, I wonder if I can do with fabric arts as a livelihood. And so she started this incredible company. She's very smart, very savvy. She knew what she needed. She needed some kind of special sewing machine. So she took $1,000 out of her savings and bought this sewing machine. She said, it doesn't work. I'm going to sell it and put that right back into my savings account. And she, this was a woman in rural Wisconsin who built a business by taking old sweaters that she picked up at charity shops or she picked up all over the place. She'd get people's old hand-me-down sweaters, Goodwill stores, whatever, where she'd pick up an old sweater and she started tearing these sweaters apart and reconfiguring them in beautiful designs. And she came up with these incredible designer sweaters that she started selling on Etsy for $300 a piece. And I said to her, she said, but I just do this from my home and sell it on Etsy. I'm not really creating an economic impact for my community. And I said, wait a minute. I said, number one, you're buying these materials from the charity shop, so you're supporting the charity shops. And I said, you're buying the materials that you need to put these sweaters together, whether it be threads or buttons or whatever materials you need, so you're shopping at those stores in your community. And I said, you are packaging these sweaters to send so that you're buying all those supplies in the community. I said, you're paying for your internet so you can be connected to Etsy. So you're supply, you're connect, you're supporting <laughs> technology in your community. And I said, and furthermore, you're sending them out through the U.S. Postal Service. And I said, I really don't know of any entity in the United States more in need of your support than the U.S. Postal Service. And she said, she smiled and she said, I never really thought about it like that. So people have to stop Mm -hmm. thinking that small is not good enough, that small Mm -hmm. is just for me. I do say we internalize these things. We we think it's just me. It's not just me when you're supporting all these other entities in your communities. Oh, what a wonderful example of it. And you're right of just breaking it down into those like all the different ways it's part of the preparing there has been a question would you say again the name of the person that who was the rock the mountain climber and because her steps are so good what's her name and does she have a website a few people have asked Um, Arlene her name is Arlene Arlene A-R-L-E-N-E Blum her last name is Blum B-L-U-M I believe she does have a website now she has a website for herself personally as well as for her the Green Policy Institute, which is the institute she founded. So if you just Google Green Policy, Arlene Blum, okay. you'll come up with a lot. Fabulous. There's such fabulous examples. I, I do have – it's shifting a little, and then I want to get to some of the questions from people. But in your first decade, what was your first experience as an entrepreneur? I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm shifting. <laughs> No, it's very interesting. I would most interesting. There are a number of things as an entrepreneur in my first decade, but I think one of the most important 
was related to my local library. My home life was abysmal. It was just a horrible situation without going into any details. And I thought in my head that there there has to be a better life. I said, how am I going to find out about it? And so I was very small at the time, and I remember going to the library and asking if what kind of books I was specifically looking for biographies. And the woman said, do you have a library card? And I said, no. And I said, she said, well, let's get you started with that. And so I got a library card, and I literally read through probably just about every biography in that library to understand how life could be better. And it so dramatically changed my life that I knew when I grew up, I wanted to do something with books so that I could help other people the way in which my life had been transformed through books. And that's how I went to college, and my first job out of college was in publishing, and I loved it. So what I think what is interesting in my life is that thread of helping me find my own voice has continued throughout my life, whether I'm in publishing or whether I'm helping people write and edit and that kind of thing in publishing, or whether I'm helping them understand their value today as an older adult is all about helping people find their voice. So I just I feel extraordinarily lucky hmm. that I've been able to do that. Oh, that's wonderful and beautiful and just shows the consistency of who we are and what our passions are and our own needs as well as nicing the needs of the world. So that's part of the finding our calling. I can't remember the quote of it right now, but you are a beautiful example of that. Oh, it's wonderful. But let me try to integrate a few of these other I have so many more questions too. We could do this for hours. Maybe you'll come back again another time, I hope. But let me integrate some of these questions if that's okay with you. So Absolutely, Ed, I love Okay. Ed from New Jersey says, when we speak of the 50-plus entrepreneurs, are we talking about new – I think you've answered a little of it, but I'm going to just read the question. When you speak about 50-plus entrepreneurs, are you talking about new entrepreneurs, ongoing entrepreneurs, or both? What are the gender demographics of senior entrepreneurs? How do successful entrepreneurs compare in a more granular view of age? And what does entrepreneurship look like in the ages of 65 to 80? a bunch of questions. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, a multifaceted question. Um, multifaceted. Let me see. Yeah. When I, to be begin, I'm speaking about new entrepreneurs. These are people over 50 who have never thought of starting a business. And the gender breakdown for the over 50 entrepreneur is it's much more lean toward women. Women over 50 starting their own businesses up through their 60s. And I have to say that in terms of the longevity Again, just from my experience in Japan, I met some fabulous senior entrepreneurs who started, one woman started a business in her mid-70s, and a man at this intergenerational workshop was in his 90s when he started his first business. And in terms of their, I can't remember the last part of that question. There was something about ongoing, if you could repeat yeah, that. Yeah, what does entrepreneurship look like in the ages of 65 to 80? It's thriving, and it's only <laughs> it's thriving, and it's you know, worldwide. It is thriving, and only getting stronger. As mm. not, it's not just individuals now starting a business, but now that governments and corporations are understanding the value of supporting this kind of entrepreneurship, they're really getting a boost in terms of their longevity, their sustainability. And as I said in that earlier statistic, five years out of starting a business, that business is still in business, 70% of those are by people over 50 versus 28% from younger individuals. Let me integrate another question. The first part was similar, but this was from Jackie. What are suggestions on how to move the needle to help people even in the older cohort. You're saying it's thriving, but are there thoughts you have of how to get even more people to stay relevant and engaged and recognize they have these creative ideas that maybe they can bring to fruition? One of the, the best ways to do that is if you're living in an area where there are either senior programs or senior living facilities, find a way 
to integrate those programs with younger people in the community. Again, in England, I was working with a wonderful group that was a cohort of leaders from different areas of aging, health aging, economy, finance, all the different aspects of aging, all the leaders in that community got together and said, they asked, what can we do to exactly what this question was, to help instill that kind of creativity amongst the older demographic and value amongst the older demographic. And I said, stop having these little coffee meetings and soirees where you're bringing people together to have them just go on a museum trip virtually or something. I said, really come up with something concrete. Invite people that you know from your various work efforts, be it health or whatever, in the senior living community, and set up a meeting in your town. And this is what they did in up by Manchester in England. They set up these little, they call them community development incubators. And what they did is they brought young people to the table and they brought older people to the table from this community. And they didn't just bring them together to share coffee or ideas or have this kumbaya moment. They said, we have a problem in this community and we need your advice on how best to solve it. So they said, we want one idea from everybody around this table. And people would come up with their ideas, and suddenly people were looking at someone across the table and thought, whoa, I never thought he could have an idea like that. Or the older people would look at the younger people and think, clearly they are interested in something other than video games. All those biases were present in the room, but you cut right through them when the community leader said, we all understand there's a problem here. How can we fix it? So you have to bring people together around a problem that they can all contribute to solve. And then you really open up the opportunity for those people to become engaged and to contribute and to have their opinion as well as the younger people's opinion valued. It's just extraordinary. But you can't just bring them together over coffee and help the through talking over mm. different things in their lives, something will happen. Create a problem and have them solve it. Well, it's a wonderful example, and it just dovetails. I always like to say to people what Marty Seligman talks about in Flourishing. Well-being is connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. And all of that around that problem and the sharing and the intergenerational is such a way for people and communities to flourish. It's such a great idea. Absolutely. So Bill has a couple of questions from Massachusetts. He has a question about housing to start with. He says, a recent survey by Realtor.com found that one in four homeowners who intend to sell in 20, 2022 up from one in five, yet everywhere you look, news reports say that the number of homes for sale continues to hit new lows. What That's causing intergenerational gridlock in the housing market as baby boomers and millennials and investors compete for low inventory. If the White House asked you to advise them based on your global perspective, what recommendations would you make to unlock the housing ladder and help baby boomers who intend to sell transition into their next phase of life? That's a big challenge. There's nothing <laughs> creating more gridlock in society today than the housing shortage, and I know my own daughter was just trying to buy a house, and the market is absolutely absurd in terms of it being overpriced and competitive, and the idea that people will ask a price for a house and then accept bid up to 50000 or or 100000 over the asking price for that house is just totally insane. And I think what, what the government has to do, the government is so gun-shy because of the economic crash due to the housing and the loan problems back in 2008. But they have to establish some guidelines for the lenders to be able to lend to people that need to buy money, even like first home buyers. What they need to do is have more loan guarantees or insurance available so that lenders are more willing to open this market to people. And it's not just young people wanting their first home. Sometimes older people wanting to resettle want a house someplace else. And so they also need that because there's such 
bias to against an older person getting a mortgage because people think, well, if you're 70 years old and taking out a 30-year mortgage, what's the chance of my getting it back? And so there's all those technical difficulties that people have to think far more creatively about how can we get more money on the market because if we get more people in houses and now, of course, the gridlock is exacerbated because people are working from home and not willing to give up their home. And it's a, as I say, it's a huge problem. But the first way I would start, and if I was speaking with Congress, I said, what kind of loan guarantees can we get from the government? And secondarily, what kind of, not a guarantee, but like in tax investment credit, can you offer lenders who are willing to help underwrite someone's mortgage. So between the tax investment credit and loan guarantees, those are the only two ways you're even going to begin to unlock this gridlock right now. Mm. Thanks. And Bill has another question, too. He said he's eager to learn more about intergenerational incubators. So if you could talk more about that, and he says, and beyond that, which crowdfunding platforms do you recommend? And is there any online network of senior entrepreneurs, local, he's in the Boston area, or international, where you can identify and interact with others who share your vision and explore collaborations? Yeah, there are lots of online networks, and if you just Google senior entrepreneurship networks, you'll find all of them of all different ilks, and you're sure to find the community in which you feel comfortable. And my challenge is, if you don't find one, start one and create a community of people that you would like to speak with and like to share ideas and strategies and what's worked and what hasn't worked. The intergenerational incubators are extremely important because, again, you're bringing seniors into an incubator, which is thought thus far to be purely the realm of young people. Incubators and accelerators, everybody thinks of some young whippersnapper startup person in there thinking like crazy. But the more you integrate older people into these, or if the incubator itself will allow an older person to come into the environment, some of them you have to come in by membership or whatever. But if they opened it up more and saw the value of it, there's a wonderful incubator in Washington, D.C., and someone from the International Finance Corporation, father was retired in his 90s, and he said, well, I feel like I'm wasting my time. There's so much information I have to share. And so his son said, why don't you join this incubator? And he'd never heard of the incubator, so he joined the incubator, and he said for the first couple of months, he just sat at the desk there, and young people would walk by staring, wondering what this 90-year-old person was doing there. And that, But then one day, one of those young people came in and asked him a question, And he was blown away by the response. And from that moment on, that person, that nine-year-old, was in huge demand by the younger people who wanted to start a business but lacked all the expertise that this person who had been a senior member of the International Finance Corporation had tucked away in their mind that they were delighted to share. So what you really, the intergenerational incubator, some, very few, are set up as intergenerational. So you just, if you're in a community, you have to find a way to get that incubator to reach out to older people in the community and bring them in and have them participate. Again, Japan was one country that one of the most successful incubators, intergenerational incubators I've ever encountered that I visited was in Oita, O-I-O-T-A, Japan. And it was just brilliant. And that's where I met the 70-plus-year-old and the 90-year-old entrepreneur. That's interesting. So that type of, so Michelle from Boston says she's curious. Why would somebody in their 90s start a business? And then she says, I find a number of senior programs focus and encourage volunteerism or based on social activities. And then further, she says, where would you steer a 65-plus woman with an entrepreneurial spirit to expand ideas and create a team? Again, the 60-plus-year-old woman, no matter where she lives, need to reach out to her community. I would even say start with the community economic development folk. And if she has an idea or she has something that she'd like to start, 
to come and present, like I presented the idea to Senator Mary Landrieu. I said, go to the community economic development folk and say, I have this idea. I think it will benefit the economic health of the community and see what kind of support she can get. And they will, in turn, also have other groups that they can recommend to this woman to help her. The In terms of the 90-year-old, why would they want to start a business? Because it doesn't matter how old you are. You just have an in curiosity. And you want to try something. You want to do something. And it's not just volunteering is wonderful. But there's something very gratifying about starting a business and creating jobs and helping others and really boosting the economy of your community. And some people never lose that. Mm -hmm. The quote that perhaps many of you on this call will remember that I absolutely love is one that is as that we don't claim because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And we then when you get older, it's not so much physical play as it is playing with ideas. And the whole concept of intellectually playing with ideas and seeing if they're going to work and test them, not just playing for the idle sake of just testing them and thinking about them, but actually putting those ideas, challenging them. Are they going to work or are they not going to work? It, it, that has no shelf life. As long as you live, you have that curiosity and that creativity and the imagination. And as, as J.K. Rowling said in her Harvard commencement address, she said the most valuable asset you can have is your imagination because we have to remember that every single thing created by humans on this planet started in someone's imagination. And I just say if you put your imagination and your creativity and your curiosity aside, then it's time to step off this planet. I don't want to be a place where I can't continue to keep learning. Wonderful. I was going to ask more questions, but this seems like just a wonderful pulling it together. And you are phenomenal. And my hunch is you are going to be continuing. I think I read somewhere that somebody asked you, are you ever going to retire? And you said, you had no. And that's how I feel about myself, too, I must say. <laughs> but any last? thoughts? First of all, how do people learn more about you or and or get in touch with you or any of your programs? Let's have that and then I want the final kind of word that you'd like to leave people with, although I think you almost have done that. But, yeah, um, they, yeah, they should feel free to reach to me. If they have further questions, reach out to you and I'd be delighted okay. to answer them. You can just send me those questions. Absolutely. Um, okay. And in terms of what they should do, I would say the most important thing you can do in life is keep asking questions. Ask why. And just, if you, again, if you stop asking questions, then life just stops. And I remember asking, speaking to my children when they'd come home from school, and everybody else would say, what did you learn today? What, blah, 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 what did your teacher say today? And to me, I always said to my children, people thought this was so unusual. I would sit at the dining room table with them and say, what questions did you ask today? And mm. then I knew how they were thinking. And so my final mm. advice is never, ever stop questioning. That's wonderful, wonderful advice for all of us. Never stop asking questions and hold on to that sense of curiosity and creativity and not be afraid to take risks. That's what you said earlier, so I'm going to add that to that, but never Absolutely. stop asking questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, excuse me, for being here today and being with us, and I do hope you will come back another time, and you are an inspiration in the work you do. May it continue, so stay safe and well. Take care. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. It's been an honor to be with you all. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.